Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Our Community with Whitney Prather. Learn about what's happening in Stark and Tuscarora's counties and the surrounding areas. We're going to highlight interesting people, businesses, organizations, churches, events, and even more. Stay tuned. Today, I'm speaking with Matt Bailey, who has over 20 years in digital marketing, working for both brands and agencies, but also as an entrepreneur, starting three companies and selling two. Matt established himself as an industry expert in the mid-2000s and now trains marketers and businesses all over the world on how to turn data into action. His training and clients include Google, Microsoft, IBM, Hewlett Packard, Nationwide, BP, and Target. His training courses are found at Duke University, LinkedIn Learning, the Association of National Advertisers, and the American Marketing Association. Matt is also a husband and father to four girls, an avid reader, and a beekeeper. Enjoy this conversation with Matt Bailey. Matt, it is such an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Whitney. It is so good to see you again and to talk with you. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So you have been doing so many different things. I'm curious just for you to tell us about you and what what you're doing and what your passions are right now. Oh, wow. Uh, well, the best thing is to say, so I started building websites in the mid 90s. <laughs> and that that should tell you everything you need to know right now. Um, so I went from there. I worked for brands. I worked for software companies. I worked for agencies. Eventually, I started my own agency around 2006. And about 10 years later, I was getting just as much demand to teach as to get agency business. And it got to the point I couldn't do both. So I sold off the agency portion of the business. And since then, I've just been teaching. And I travel, I work with brands, I teach marketers uh, literally all over the world how to do digital marketing, how to not spend more money than they have and how to see and measure results. So that that's kind of the the career in a nutshell. I love it. I love it. I think that, you know, the internet and all of its evolutions has made it really possible for educators to kind of come onto the scene and emerge and teach people in really kind of non-traditional ways. Um, so that's so cool that you're getting to do that. So what you you teach di- digital marketing, but what who are who are your clients? Uh, so I work a lot with Microsoft's worldwide learning to teach their internal marketing people uh, just different uh, different aspects of marketing and measurement. Uh, I've done a lot with IBM. Uh, just in the past few months, I've worked with Target and Capital One uh, hey. and BP. And so it's, it's you never know who's going to pick up the phone and call. Um, yeah. Probably the, the most exciting project I've been working on in the past year is developing a digital media academy in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, And so we've created a nine week course to immerse people in digital marketing. And these are government workers, entrepreneurs. Uh, It's it's a great mix of people and content creators. And uh, the next project I'm working with them on is something that's really close to my heart. And that's developing a digital literacy curriculum for high school kids uh, within the UAE, as well as will branch into the the larger Arab world as well. Um, But this is something that I, I, you know, here in the U.S., I'm pushing it locally, uh, but also to see this get traction of, you know, technology is moving so much faster than many of us can keep up. And the literacy of knowing what information is real, uh, how can I avoid getting taken advantage of or, you know, becoming a a victim of a phishing attack? Uh, All these things are so critical now to using the internet every day. 
Wow. Okay. So you said a mouthful and I am going to try to remember what to ask, but first I'm thinking of the correlation between like, um, there's a, a human trafficking organization that I'm a part of. And a lot of what we're hearing is how a lot of these teenage girls are getting trafficked through mm. the internet, through some of these schemes. So are you, when you're talking about digital media literacy and how not to get taken advantage of, are you actually teaching that kind of thing as well? Like, Hey, here's how to spot someone who is trying to scam you. Yeah. Uh, it starts there with, well, actually t- let's say, let's back up. It starts with number one, understanding privacy settings on any social media or any account that you have is what do these privacy settings mean? What do they do? But then also your digital footprint. And that's what you say and what you post that it's out there forever. And so it's realizing how I'm putting myself out there online. The next level is how to understand headlines clickbait. Uh, Mm -hmm. Who benefits from clickbait? And what's the economy that drives clickbait and fake news and sensationalized headlines? And so it's now insulating yourself against this sensationalized content that wants you to click because people make money when you click. The next level is how to avoid scams. If it sounds too good to be true and how are people uh, presenting links that if I click on it, then my computer gets taken over, you know, so there's different layers, but ultimately I would say the overriding thing that we're teaching is critical thinking okay. is not to believe everything. And how do you compare? Where do you go to find information? And the better you are equipped with critical thinking the better you can think through some of these things rather than just react. And that is, you know, in the modern internet for the next 20 years, uh, the kids that we teach and even adults, that's the number one skill that you're going to need to be able to work online, to develop skills online, to, to find information is, is you need that critical thinking element. I love it. I love it because The truth of the matter is that our children are using this technology quicker at an earlier age than what a lot of us are comfortable with. I mean, (laughs) digital learning. Hello, my five-year-old has a brand new Chromebook that her school gave her, (laughs) and I think it's going to follow her throughout and throughout her elementary or beyond. And, you know, I looked away and she was on Google and she knows what Google is. And I know that there's some pretty powerful settings on there, but the fact that you're saying this right now, I'm totally identifying with the need for this kind of thing because man, how do you steward this? Mm -hmm. And I also identify with signing up for a new, you know, social media platform clubhouse right now is like the big one that I'm trying to get into. But (laughs) when you, when you sign up for a new platform, you do, you want to hit agree, agree, agree. So you can get in and, and you don't really take your time to go through all of the privacy settings. So this is super crucial. Well, and, and keeping up on it, I mean, Instagram just changed their terms of service. And if you have their mobile app installed and you agree to these new terms of service, you're agreeing to let them view all your photos, your contacts, uh, you know, uh, an amazing amount of data. And if you read through that, I I don't think anyone's going to be really comfortable staying with it. Um, Uh. So, you know, (laughs) just now that's, uh, but no, see, here's the thing we talk about literally like my platform that I I know, I know it's powerful (laughs) and it, and it works, but Facebook owns it. And let's look at what Facebook has done with data and, and they, their bottom line is using your data to sell you stuff. It is a purely economic driven model. And, you know, I could go into the ethics of it as well. But and here's the thing we talk about from the personal side of social media. My teaching also goes into the professional side of entrepreneurs, business owners and and marketers. They get caught up in what I call the shiny objects like, you know, TikTok. That's the newest shiny object. And they run to it. And wow, all these people are using it. So as a business, 
I should go advertise or I should go use it. Well, wait yeah. a minute. Let's think through it. Let's let's involve some critical thinking and some research. So it's not just teens that get caught up in it. It's the, you know, the 40, you know, the 30 year old marketer, the 25 year old marketer, all of them, they get, you know, the shiny headlines, the clickbait headlines, the news media is telling us TikTok's all great. So even marketers go there and business owners go there and they end up losing a lot of money. So it's, it's this digital literacy so, covers the I spectrum. I'm so curious about that because my, I, I think there's different like neighborhoods of TikTok, you know, like <laughs> the, the neighborhood I live in, there's a lot of like real estate agents using it. There's a lot of marketers. There's a lot of um, people who are using TikTok for business. And I don't know, I love it. And I don't even, I use the platform and don't even think about, um, some of the pitfalls that are occurring. So, wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so what are we to do, Matt? Are we to just abandon all of these platforms and just not be on them? Well, that's up to you to decide. I mean, it's up for everyone to really determine their level of comfort with each of these platforms. Here's the bottom line. It's free which means someone has to pay for the cost of the development, the cost of the, you know, the maintenance, the, the, you know, the, the, for the program to exist. And right now, the way you are paying for that is with your data. And we call this surveillance capitalism. And that means that all of these social media platforms, everything we, we take for granted and, and we use it and it's free, but we're paying for it with our data. Because now advertisers go to these platforms and say, you know, I want to reach someone in this age who lives here, who has recently searched for this or fits this profile, and they pay the money. And the platform now is, you know, we're not the customer. The advertiser is the customer and the customer's king. We yeah. are the product. And so that's what I mean. It's up to your level of comfort. <laughs> it's up to your level of comfort. Um, everything you do is recorded. Everything you say, you post, it's all recorded and it's put into uh, a machine learning algorithm to learn what you're going to buy next and what type of advertiser uh, wants to target you. So do you therefore think that Facebook advertising and Instagram advertising is like, do you put the kibosh on that? I mean, you're running a business. <laughs> you have a business. How do you yeah. market? Do you, do you I, advertise on these platforms? Wow. I personally do not use uh, Facebook or Instagram in my own personal business. Uh, I, I talk with every client or, or person that I work with. And I let them know, you know, there's some, you know, from, from my standpoint, there's some ethical issues that, you know, I don't trust what Facebook does with my data. I don't trust with this. Now here's the upside as an advertiser, it can be effective. You can reach yeah. people, you can sell product, you can use that. Uh, just realize that where that data comes from, not everyone knows. Uh, and not everyone has, you know, signed on to that so fully no, or understands what it means. So there is a conflict there. And I do explain that to people. Um, but almost any social platform is going to have that same conflict. So yeah, oh I can't gosh. answer that for everybody. It's up, like I said, again, <laughs> it's up to your own level of comfort. Uh, now there's some businesses that are saying, hey, the ROI is fantastic. We're all yeah. over it. We're, we're going to do it. Um, and, and others, I, I think, are just a little bit more hesitant, especially coming out of the the election, you know, there were some brands that tried to boycott Facebook because they wouldn't stop political advertising or or manage it, uh, which essentially was a big cash grab by Facebook to say, we'll take political advertising because that's millions of dollars of advertising. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of your big brands stopped advertising. Other brands jumped in and started advertising more. Uh, so Facebook had a record quarter, you know, through the election. Wow. Wow. Okay. So this is kind of like the more, you know, you know, <laughs> um, talk to me about the course that you're, that you're, um, that you have, um, it's for, so do you have more than one course 
product? Is it for nine to uh, ninth grade to twelfth grade? Um, but then you also do more. So I want to know what's a part mm-hmm. of your course. What we're developing now is a ninth to twelfth grade curriculum, uh, and that will be. F- you know, throughout the the United Arab Emirates that we're developing, um, but then also I I kind of have an adult curriculum that I use in my training, uh, okay. and so that's more like a business oriented of again how to recognize clickbait, how to recognize sensational headlines in the media, and how to evaluate a new advertising platform, like a social platform. So, you know, when a business will, will evaluate TikTok's the newest one, we'll evaluate what's being said. What are the claims being made? What are the, what are the case studies that are coming out of there? And how do we critically evaluate this data? Usually most of the information. So like right now, TikTok's it's talking about how many users, how long they're on and, the interesting thing is that's all data that benefits TikTok. It's very rare to find data where, which is beneficial to a potential advertiser of this is the ROI of the campaign. This is what I can expect. And the problem is a lot of people measure the wrong things. Like they measure views, but how many clicks did you get out of it? How much sales did you get out of it? Are you, you know, and then compared to your other advertising channels, How did that stack up? So what's the efficiency of using this against something else? There's a lot of questions to ask. And so, you know, from the the business standpoint, I teach literacy in in that realm. Uh, From the high school, it's focused a lot on, you know, getting into recognizing clickbait. One of the the more fun projects we do, if you've never had fifth graders develop clickbait ads, it is the (laughs) best project ever because fifth graders come up with the most creative clickbait and it's hilarious. Um, And so I'll have them do that and they submit it and we laugh at it. But you know what? They can now recognize it because they've created it and they know what it's meant to do. Uh, and so part of it Can is- you give us an example of that? Oh my goodness. Um, I'm trying to think what one of them was because it was just fantastic. It was, it was something like Joey fell asleep in class and you won't believe what happened next. You know, so, you. you know, he, he got the phrase right in there. Um, the, the, and, so and some so- of the, oh, I was ahead. just going to say some of the click, the clickbaity, uh, the clickbait, um, ads that I've seen is along those lines of you won't believe what your favorite 90s heartthrob looks like now right, or something right. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I guess when you when you walk it back like that, what are they what is in it for them when you click? What is in it for them? So just by clicking on something like that, mm-hmm. kind of prow- browsing through the website real quick and then going back, someone's making money off of that. Right. Absolutely. Because as soon as you click on it, you go to a page and that page has ads. And if it's got ads on it, you just by clicking on that made them a lot of money. Um, But I love so let's break down clickbait because I think everyone needs to know that. Yeah. Now, I have a journalism background. I think you're very similar too, Whitney. Yeah. So what's the purpose of a headline? To grab attention. Grab attention. But also... What, you know, and this is what I was taught in journalism. It's the inverted pyramid style, which means the top of the pyramid is the biggest. It's inverted. And that's my headline. And in my headline, I'm trying to communicate as much information as possible. About the story. About the story. So that you yeah. know what the story is about. Clickbait turns this around and it removes and it creates what's called a curiosity gap that there's some information missing that makes you want to know. And let your example, what's your favorite nineties heartthrob look like now? Oh, you, you know, it, it's that curiosity. And, and uh, unfortunately clickbait appeals to the basis of our curiosity, the basis of our, dis- it revolves around, you know, I love to joke. It's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's that's what, clickbait revolves around it's it, you know it, it's no secret that they're image heavy they're visual heavy they they use you know some scandalous pictures but it's meant to create curiosity and in that curiosity that's where you click 
you go to the site and yes, they're making money from the ads. Uh, and the site seldomly delivers. Like, I don't it think never you really delivers. see a good picture <laughs> of the heartthrob. You know what I mean? It's like a uh, yep. click off, you know? <laughs> it never delivers. That's the thing about kick clickbait. It, it never delivers. It never satisfies. And sometimes you'll get into these sites where, you know, it'll show pictures, but then you have to click again. And then you have to click again to go. And it's like this 30 click length article or images or something. And what you're doing every time you click is it's reloading ads. They're making more money. And so, yeah, that that's the downside. I mean, it, it's built to take advantage of our curiosity and it, yes, never delivers. Yeah. You know what? You said something interesting that I don't think I realized was happening. Like, so something that I wouldn't necessarily think would be like more like clickbaity. It, it, it is something that happens, I think, even in our industry of like marketing. So I've seen these websites where you click for the first tip and then you have to click for the next tip. Yes. And you're right on the sides, there are ads, you know, and you click through. Well, on the fourth click, I'm not, I'm not going to step 17 because Nope. <laughs> I just need the information. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So it's 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 in so many different industries, not just one industry. Mm -hmm. No, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. I mean, you, you know, compared to 10 years ago, compared to 15 years ago or, or longer, the Internet has become a very aggressive place. Uh, mm. It's aggressive to get your click. It's aggressive to show you ads, uh, you, you know, going to sites that immediately there's a pop up that, hey, we want to show send you notifications. No, yeah, no. <laughs> you know, everyone wants a piece of you. Uh, yeah. And it's so different than it was 10, 15, even, you know, of course, 20 years ago. I, I feel like it was so innocent then. And now everything is profit driven, economic driven uh, to get your click, to get your eyes. Uh, to get your attention. Yeah. They say that like every five posts on Facebook is an ad. Um, yeah. And I've found that to be definitely accurate. Yeah, I don't doubt that and at all. <laughs> I, I sign up for just in an in industry. It, there's a different kind of digital marketing industry that's happening that is a subset of what we experience because of the internet and because of the because of emails, but I've noticed I've had to unsubscribe to a lot of education based content because they send me so many emails. Mm. So twice a day, what are you doing? Sending me an email twice a day wow. when they're selling something or it's very much like, Hey, Whitney, this is waiting for you. I can't wait. It's all like, they're my buddies, yeah. but it's like way too much. I've noticed this of, you know, in, in inbox email marketing, um, that that's an industry that I I love. Um, I'm an email marketer. I love it. But I've noticed that there's so much, and it goes to your point of how aggressive it is. Two emails in a day, mm -hmm. and that's not 10 just emails a week. Yeah. That's too much. <laughs> well, and not just that. And you alluded to this. They're becoming much more personalized. And, you know, we haven't heard from you. You haven't clicked on us in a while. Yes. That type of thing. And it appeals to, again, our emotion. Yeah. And so there is a lot of science behind why these things work. Uh, and so that creates a, another gap with us. It's a sympathy or an empathy gap where someone is, oh, they're really trying to get a hold of me. No, those yeah. are pre-written. They're pre-written, yeah. they're sent out on a schedule, it's blasted to everybody, but they're written in a and it way- it has your name in it. It's got your <laughs> name, it's just to you and they miss you. Uh, so yeah, it's it's there's so much science behind this now of what makes people click. And I think there has to be a line because I, I am the person who usually crafts these messages, you know, like <laughs> that's the kind of, yeah. I'm an email marketer, um, but- I think there has to be some type of ethics that go along with it as well. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with communicating to your audience how much you value them and that you love them. But boy, when you just met me, I just got on your email list. I know these feelings for me aren't true. Like, you know, just like that kind of a thing. So mm -hmm. anyway, I do want to transition because I read something in your bio that you were a, a beekeeper 
And so yeah. we have to talk about that for a second. <laughs> yeah. I, well, it started probably, wow. I want to say almost 10 years ago. Uh, we have a tree in our backyard that just had a hollow in it and uh, it, they were swarming. So I called a friend of mine who's a beekeeper and he showed up and he says, well, have you ever thought about keeping bees? <laughs> I'm like, yes, this is great. So we started with that. Um, you know, we usually keep about two to three, maybe four colonies uh, a year, just depending on how, how things go. And it's just one of those hobbies that has just grown. And every year I'm, I'm researching more and learning more. I'm fascinated with it. Um, wow. And, uh, it, I absolutely love it. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, and it's so rewarding. And, and yeah, you're I, doing I, a good thing. Yeah. I usually don't say it's, they take care of themselves. I just give them a place to live. That's, <laughs> that's really it. So what are some of the things that you have to do as a beekeeper? I mean, like, what do you, what are some of the things that you, you do you have a little suit that you have to go out in? And- I've got the suit. Um, it, it, with a couple of my, a couple of my hives, I've had them long enough. And I feel like maybe the queen gets to know you where I, I wouldn't use the suit after about a year or two of having the same colony, they got used to me and I could get in there and pull it apart and not wear anything and be very, never got stung uh, once getting into the, uh, into the, the hive uh, for newer ones. They're a little more aggressive. They got to kind of get to know who you are. Uh, but in the spring, it's just making sure they're healthy, replacing some of the, the brood comb where they lay their eggs and, and, mm-hmm. and this, all that uh, kind of clearing things up. And then really they know what to do for the rest of the year. Uh, then about late fall, I'll pull the honey and that's the fun part. That's where we extract the honey. Uh, and, and, you know, and everyone loves getting fresh, pure honey as a gift yes. for Christmas. So that's one yeah. of our, our things. So <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. Yeah. It, just, it goes to show that how layered we are, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. Yeah. I always like to ask people, I always like to end by asking people what they're excited about. It could be related to this um, topic of digital marketing and how you are educating people, or it could be unrelated to that. So what are you excited about? What am I excited about? You know, we've talked about it. I'm excited about digital literacy. Uh, I've got uh, four kids and uh, three are still in school. And it's interesting I'll see them studying math and science. And one of them has been doing a lot of digital literacy. And I've been talking with our teachers about that Mm -hmm. because math, science, they're great, but you know what they're going to use every day, the internet. And they need to be skilled in how to use the tool in order to use it properly. And Mm -hmm. so digital literacy is something a child will use every day in order to do math, in order to do science. So I think it should be a part of the the permanent curriculum of any school. That's what I'm excited about. That's what I'm pushing. Uh, Locally here, I'm making myself available for any speaking engagement, for any uh, help organizationally or within the school, Uh, you know, locally free of charge. I do not charge for local speaking engagements and local training uh, because this is something that needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have someone that I would love to connect you with um, uh, in the human trafficking world because I just think that people need to um, know a lot more. Um, yes. You know, it, and it goes back to these critical skills that you, these critical thinking skills that you were talking about. So we can find you on sitelogic.com. Is that correct? Sitelogic.com. That's S I T uh, S I T L O G I C sitelogic.com. And yeah, I, I, that's my home base there. And I also have a podcast that goes out about every two weeks. Uh, yes. every, yeah, everything from digital marketing to ad fraud, to social media, to marketing, um, that that's, you know, one of our most famous podcasts is, uh, uh, you know, Sue Grabowski, uh, she yeah. and I talked about what we call the lame LinkedIn pickup lines. 
uh, which is when people connect with you on LinkedIn and they give you that generic picked up line, which means they didn't look at your profile. They don't know who you are and they're trying to sell you something. So th- that's kind of the fun we have with the podcast is, is just talking about it. media, culture, that type of thing. Nice. So good. Well, Matt, thank you so much for your time. I am uh, excited about what you're doing. I think there's such a need for media literacy, digital media literacy. literacy. So thank you so much for, for, you know, taking this on and being so passionate. I appreciate you and just good luck in 2021. Thank you so much, Whitney. I really appreciate that. It was great to be with you today. And hey, I look forward to talking with you even more in the future. Yes, for sure. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you to our guest today and thank you for tuning in. Cheers. Until next time. 